Hi, great to have you on board of this video. Do you want to learn Python? Then why don't you learn it by creating something entertaining and funny, a game for example. This is exactly what we will do in this video. We will build a game in Python, from scratch, no prior Python knowledge is required. The game will run in the terminal and in this game we as the player will fight against the monster. We will be able to create the player name, we can attack the monster, we can heal ourselves, we can even display high scores from previous rounds and more cool things. So if you want to learn Python right now, this is your chance to do so. So before we dive into Python, let's have a look at the actual game that we want to build. The game will actually consist of a player, us basically, and a monster. The player has certain attributes, you could say. For example, the player name, the player could have an attack, so an attack which allows us to, well, harm the monster. We could have something like a heal feature, which allows us to increase our health level. And we also need a health indicator, a health status bar, which shows us if we are still alive or if we are, well, dead. The same thing is true for the monster. The monster also could have some attributes like name and the health indicator and also the attack feature. Let's say that the monster shouldn't be allowed to heal itself though, so the monster basically only can attack ourselves. Now to control this entire game flow, we need something like a user interface, which allows us to select an action. We are always working from the player perspective, of course. This means an action we can select is basically only attack or heal. So let's say we want to attack the monster right here. If we do so, we will have an impact on the health of the monster and decrease the monster's, well, health status. After this attack, we have to check if the monster is still alive. So if the health level is smaller than or equal to zero. If this is the case, so if we say yes, the monster is basically not alive anymore, then we have to make sure that the player wins and that a new round of the game starts, or a new game starts in general. In case the monster is still alive though, well, the monster will attack back automatically. With that, the monster will of course affect our health negatively. Then we have to implement the same check we had before. We have to check if our health level is below or equal to zero, if that's the case, well, then unfortunately, the monster won the game and we have to start a new one. If this is not the case, so if we are still alive, well, then we go back to our user interface and we can start the next round by selecting another action. In our case, this would be attack or heal. So that's the game we want to build in a nutshell. As I said, we will build this all from scratch with Python and for that, we need to use and understand some core Python features. So what will we learn in here regarding Python? We will have a look at variables. Variables allow us to store information in our code and to access it whenever we need it. We'll also have a look at user input. This means we will learn how we can make sure that the user can enter data and that we can react to the input the user made. We'll also have a look at operators. Operators allow us to subtract or add different items, or also to check whether an item is smaller or bigger than another item, for example. Besides that, we'll have a look at lists and dictionaries. Dictionaries are special ways, you could say, to store information in Python, and also one of the key concepts we will cover in this video. We'll also have a look at functions in Python, so we will learn how we can create functions, what functions are, and why we need them to create reusable code definitely one of the core features of every programming language, basically. We'll also have a look at control structures. These are things like if statements, for example. You might have heard about that. This means we execute code if a certain condition is true, well, or not. And finally, we'll have a look at f-strings, so-called formatted string literals. These are things which allow us to dynamically inject information from outside into a so-called string. This is a bit more advanced right here, but we will come to a point in the video where this makes perfect sense to you. Now with that, we can leave this theoretical planning part and jump directly into our code. And to get started, you need an IDE. In my case, I will use Visual Studio Code. And you need Python 3 installed on your machine. Installation guidelines for both of these can be found in the video description. Now, once you 
created a new project in your IDE, we can create a Python file right here. We click onto this button and now we can give this file any name we want. In my case, I will name it game. The important thing is that we add .py to this file. This will turn it into a file Python can read then. And in this file, we can now get started. And as I said, we need a player and a monster. These are the core components of our game, you could say. And the player and the monster have certain attributes. So if you think about the player, we could say that our player should have a name. Um, a name could be manual in this case, for example, my name. Now, if we save that, you see that we get an error immediately. If we hover over it, you can see that we created an undefined variable, manual. And that's the first important concept we will cover here. Writing text like this in our code won't work here. We have to put this information, this specific information into a so-called variable. Variables simply allow us to store information in our code and to access this information later. Now, to make this a bit more precise right here, we could say that actually manual should just be the value or the information that we want to store right here. And this information should be stored in a variable which could be named player underscore name, for example. That's the naming convention in Python for variables. We type the name with small letters. And if we have a combination of different names like player name in here, we connect these different names with an underscore. Then we add a space and set the variable equal to the information that should be stored in this variable. In that case, the name manual. Now, if we save it now, we can see that the error regarding the variable right here is gone because we basically declared that variable. So we assigned a value to this variable, manual in this case. But if I hover over manual right here, you can see that this is still an undefined variable. Now, the problem is that the information in a variable has to have a specific data type. Data types in Python are numbers, so integers in this case. As you can see, if I save this now, we don't have an error. These are floats, like 1.2 for example. This is also working. We have booleans. A boolean would be true, like that, written with a capital letter at the beginning. Or false, written like that. Or, as we have it in our case, strings. Strings should be wrapped in quotation marks. This can be double quotation marks like this or single quotation marks. Generally, you can use whichever you want. The important thing is to be consistent though. I will stick to single quotation marks in this project here. Now, we can add the player name right here in the quotation marks, manual. And with that, you can see that we now don't get an error and that manual now is a string. So to summarize that, we now declared a variable named player name. And this variable contains information, in this case, the string manual. That's basically our first variable. Now, we can of course create additional variables here. Another one could be player attack, for example. We talked about that already. And this could have an integer now, let's say 10. We could also add player heal, for example, where we can heal our player, which could be a value of 16. We might have to work on these values later. And we could add health, for example, right here as the last variable, which could have a value of 100. So with that, we basically defined our player right here. This doesn't do a lot though. If we now execute the code that we wrote in this file, we will see that nothing is displayed down here in our terminal. This is what I talked about at the beginning of this video, that our user interface will be this part right here, this terminal. By the way, if you don't see this terminal, you can always make it appear right here if you go to view and then click right here onto terminal. This will make it appear down here. However, if we now execute this file by entering Python and now the file name, so game.py, like this, and hit enter, you can see that we don't get an error or something like that, but that nothing is printed or displayed down here. Now, by saying printed, I already gave you a hint what we can do next. Because in Python, we can print or display the output of our code, so to say, by adding so-called print statements. Now, a print statement is written like that. You type print. Then you open the quotation marks right here and then you enter, well, basically what you want to print right here. This could be a string, for example, like hello. If I now repeat the command right here, like this, 
you can see that we printed hello down there. Now, in our case, we don't want to print any random string. We might want to print the information that we stored in a variable. For example, right here in our player name. For that, we remove the content here and now add player name right here. As you can see, we already get the suggestions in the IDE right here. So this makes it easier to select the variable we want to refer to. In that case, I will use player name and hit tab. And if we now save that and run the code again, you can see that manual down here is printed in our console. So these are two important things we learned already. We can use variables and we can print the output of our code in the terminal by using such a print statement. Now the problem is that actually using four variables for our player is not really the most logical approach actually. Wouldn't it be better to basically have one variable, player for example? And if we would then have an option to access a specific information of that variable, for example the attack right here. Because if I want to do this now, I have to change player name to player attack right here and then rerun the code and this will return the value for the attack. But as you can see, that's not really convenient and also not a really nice coding style right here. Therefore, we need an option to basically combine all this information in such a single variable. For that, let's maybe create another variable and let's call it player this time. And now set it equal to, well, to what? In Python, we have different options to add multiple information to such a variable. A very common one is a so-called list. A list is always written like that. So you use the squared brackets right here and then you enter content into your list. In our case, our list could have four different types of content. It could have the string manual, which will be the name and the four, uh, the three integers, 10, 16 and 100. So I could now type manual right here. Then I could type 10, 16, 100. That would be possible. And if I now comment out this code right here, this is shift command and seven right here as a shortcut that I can use. And as you can see by that, we automatically add the hash tags right here right at the beginning. So this means this code is now not used, you could say. So this code will not be executed basically. It's just there as kind of notes for us or we can keep the code right here and maybe reuse it later, but it's not used at the moment. And here we get an error now because of that, because as you can see, the variable is no longer defined because we commented it out. But if I now change the player attack to player right here, save the file, always important, otherwise it won't work. And now run Python game again. You can see that the content of our list right here is printed. We can also check the type of the content we have right here because I'm referring to this list all the time. And if you add type right here in front of the variable that you want to print and now add the parenthesis right here, and if you now save the file and run the code again, you can see that we created a list right here. That's also an important concept. You can always check the type of the information you stored right here, for example, in your variable by using this type um, method right here. However, we don't need that here. We only need to print it. And the problem is also that we don't want to access the entire content. As before, we might want to access the name only right here. We can do this with lists. For that, we simply add the square brackets again right here. And now we can basically select a specific item in our list by using a so-called index. The index always starts with zero in such a list. What does this mean? This basically, so the first item has an index of zero. The second item, 10 right here, has an index of one. And the third item has an index of two. The fourth item has an index of three and so on. So this means if I now simply add zero right here, so the index of zero right there, and now run our code once again, you can see that manual is printed right here in our console. If you change it to two, for example, then what is printed? Well, I hope you guessed it. It's 16 now because we have the index two. So the third item in our list right here. So with that, we now achieved a lot already. We are now able to store all the information that is related to our player in such a list 
and we can access it by simply using this player variable and then using the index to print a specific item in that list. Now besides accessing it, we can also change the value that we have in such a list. We can do this by simply typing player, then again the square brackets, and now again the index that we might want to change. Let's say we are not happy with our value for the attack right here. Let's say we want to set it equal to 12, for example. For that, we access our current list item with the index 1 and now set it equal to 11 maybe, like that. If I now print that right here, so we print the item with the index 1 again, and if we now execute that code, you can see that we change the content of this list item to 11. However, let's say we are happy with that and we don't want to change the value. Because there is another problem right here. Although we stored the information in our list, we don't actually see what the actual, well, value is. I mean, it's obvious for us that this is a name. But how should we know that 10 right here refers to an attack right here? This refers to the amount we can heal ourselves and that this is our health bar. Mm, that's not totally clear right here. Therefore, a list is not the perfect solution in this case. So let's also comment out this here. Because besides lists, we also have another really common option to store data right here in Python. These are so-called dictionaries. A dictionary works like this. You type the player and now set it equal to content in curly braces. Between these curly braces, you now don't add the items as before, so with like um, manual right here, then a comma and then the next item. It doesn't work like that because dictionaries always work with so-called key value pairs. Now what's a key, what's a value? Well in our case we store the name as a value so our key would be the name. Let's type name right here, also important in the quotation marks, these are important. But then we don't add a comma or something like that, we add a colon right here and then we add the value that belongs to that key. In our case this is manual, so the name, like that. Then we add a comma and then we add the second key. In our case this would be attack, like that. Then we add a colon and then we add the value for our attack. This is 10 in our case. No quotation marks are required of course because we have an integer here. After that we have a heal key this one right here, so quotation marks, colon, and the value. And finally, we have our health right there, colon, and 100. So, this is now a so-called dictionary. As you saw, dictionaries work different than lists, and this also refers to the way we can access our items in the dictionary. If we, for example, run our code once again, then you see that we get a key error right here. So we basically can't access our dictionary with this index right here. This doesn't work. The reason for that is that we need to access the values that we stored in our dictionary by the key. So in our case, we can simply say that we want to access the player name right here. And if we now run the code like this, you can see that we print the name manual right here once again. We can also access different values, of course, by simply changing the key. This could be something like attack right here, for example. If we now run the code, we can access the value of 10. Now, such a dictionary is, of course, a way better approach to access the information we have in the dictionary, because throughout the game, we will have to access our attack, we will then have to access the impact that the attack has on the health of the monster, and so on. So with this dictionary, we actually got a nice way of storing our player and monster-related information. Now, because of that, we can delete all that out commented code right here, like that. And now we can also add our monster right here. It follows the same logic actually, so basically our monster is equal to a dictionary. And the monster will also have a name key, like that. And let's give it a name of maybe Max for example. Then we have an attack also for the monster, uh, which could have a value of maybe, let's say it's a bit stronger, it's 12. We might have to adjust these values later, so let's use these as dummy values for the moment. Then we have, well, we don't have a heal option because let's say the monster can only attack the player and can't heal itself. And this means we only need the health right here at the end with a value, 
starting value of 100 also. Now we got the information we need for the monster and the player, but so far the user doesn't see anything right here on the screen. You can see the different values depending on the key we access, but actually that's not the information that we want to display when the game is started. What we actually would like to have is some kind of user interface, which guides the user to select a specific option. In the case of the player, this can only be attack or heal. These are the two options we have. But we can use the print statements we learned already to, well, create such a user interface. Let's say we first want to print something like please select action. We learned that we can refer to variables and to print the information stored in the variables already. But of course, if we add a single quotation mark, as I showed you some minutes ago, and add a string right here, then we can also print this information. So as I said, we can say please select action, like that. And then we can add two more print statements with the first one saying something like attack, right? And the second option would be to heal player or just heal, maybe like that. If we save that and run our code once again, then you can see that these statements are printed right here in our terminal and this should now be the starting screen the player sees when he starts the game. The problem now is that, well, we basically can't interact with that. As you can see, we don't have any options to, well, add information right here or something like that, so we basically only have these print statements. Therefore, we need to allow our player to add some input to our game right here. And this brings us to another default method Python ships with, the input method. The input method is simply, well, written like that, input, and now by adding the parentheses right here. And that's it already. With that, if we save that, now run the code again, you can see down here that we now have the option to enter some, well, information right here, or to add some input. This could be one, two, three, whatever. In our case, we should only be able to select one or two, also something we'll work on later. But if I now add one right here, I add the input, and then we exit the game already. Now, this exiting problem is something we will also have a look at in a few minutes. For the moment, let's make sure that something happens after the player selected a specific input. For that, we need a so-called control structure in Python. Control structures are for loops, while loops, or, that's the one we need right here, if statements. An if statement simply allows you to execute a specific code that you define, of course, if a certain condition or multiple conditions are true. Now let's create such an if statement to see how this works in our case. To create an if statement, you simply type if, and now you add the condition that should be true to make sure that the code you then define is running. In our case, the input right here, so basically the information we return right here, should be equal to one, right? So if the player entered run, and this should then lead to an attack against the, against the monster. We again need to declare a variable right here. And this variable now could be the player choice, for example, like that. With that, we can now refer to our player choice right here. And if this player choice is equal, now important, not with a single equal sign, because this will basically set the variable equal to, well, something. In our case, we don't want to change the information stored in the variable. We only want to check if the information stored in the variable is equal to something. This means we have to add a second equal sign and now say, if our player choice is equal to one, then we have to add a colon. And then if you hit enter, you can see that we get this automatic indentation right here. This is important. In Python, we basically use indentation to specify where our code belongs to. In our case, this means that this code right here, which for example could be a print statement saying attack right here, only gets executed if this condition is true. So if this is true, execute the code, this indented code right here. If we run our code now, you can see if we hit one attack, well, we don't get the print statement right here, right? So this doesn't work here. We only get one, this was our input, but nothing is displayed. And actually, our player choice was equal to one, but this is not working. The problem here is that input right here always returns a string. And this means we compare player choice right here to 
an integer. Now, player choice is not equal to this integer, to, to one. Therefore, this code right here is not executed. Again, you can also check this by adding type um, player choice, like that. And if you now say that you print this statement first, right here, then you can see if you hit one, that we return a string right here. That's what I was referring to. Therefore, this check doesn't work at the moment. Now, let's get rid of that code. And let's now simply turn this one right here into a string by adding single quotation marks, like that. If we do this and run our code once again, like that, and hit attack, then you can see that attack is printed right here. And with that, we now wrote our first successful if statement right here. Now, with that new knowledge, we can of course also add the second condition we have right here. If the player selects two, we want to heal our player. For that, we simply enter additional code, but now important, not indented, because as I said, the indented code will run if this condition right here, this one is true. Therefore, we have to start right here and now add a so-called elif statement. Elif simply stands for else if. So basically, if this condition is true, do this. Else, so elif, another condition is true, then well, execute another code. Now, this other condition right here is pretty straightforward for us, of course. We simply have to check if our player choice is equal, important, single quotation mark, two. And if this is true, then we want to print, let's say, heal player, like that. And we could also say that if our user enters any different input, so not one or two, then something like invalid input should be printed to our console, to our terminal down here. So with that, again, not indented, we add else right here this time. Else is different from elif as else doesn't require any additional condition. It simply says, well, if this is not true and well, if that is not true, well, then in all other cases, simply execute a different code. In our case, this could be, as I said, print invalid, oops, invalid input right here, like that. Let's now run this code. So again, so if we enter one, we can see that we print attack. If you run the code again and hit two, we run heal player. And if we enter anything else, like five, for example, we get the output invalid input here. Now with that, we got our first logic in here. Let's now focus on to our first condition right here. So if the player choice is equal to one, because these print statements are nice, but actually that's not what should happen here. Because if the player choice was one, then we want to attack the monster. This means we want to access the attack key right here in our player with the value 10. And after that, we want to access our health key right here in our monster variable and decrease the monster health by this 10 right here or whatever value we use for our attack right here. Now, how can we do this? Well, let's maybe add some space here and let's now delete the print statement because we learned everything we need to achieve this. The first thing we need to do is we need to access our monster health because that should change in the end. For that, we can again refer to this monster variable right here and now add the square brackets right here and access our health key. We learned that already, so we simply type health right here. This health should now be equal to something else. This means we don't want to compare it to anything. We want to set it equal to something. So we want to change the information stored in that health key. For that, we use a single equal sign. And now say that again, the monster health right here. So important, I'm now referring to the initial status of the monster health. So this 100 right here. So this initial value for the monster health should decrease by, well, by what? Well, minus the player, right? Our player variable, again, the square brackets, and now attack. So basically by the value that is stored in our attack key. And after that, let's say we want to print our monster health once again to see if this operation was successful. For that, we run the game once again. We now attack the monster. And as you can see, apparently it worked because now the monster health decreased to 90. So this is pretty cool, 
But actually the monster is not the only party which can be attacked right here. The player can also be attacked. Now we can use the same logic actually we have right here. Let's maybe add the space down here. And let's now say that after the monster was attacked by the player, well, the monster will fight back, so also the player health will decrease. Now for that we can use the exact same logic. We can simply say that our player health right here is equal to our player health, so the initial value we have for the player health, minus our, well, monster attack right here, like that. And let's now maybe also add the player health to our terminal down there to see if it was successful. And let's then check what happens. So if we run the game once again, the player attacks the monster and the monster fights back. This means after this round, the monster health is at 90, which makes sense. We had an attack of 10 against this health of 100. And the player health is at 88 because the monster attack of 12, well, had an impact to our initial health level of 100. So if we run the game once again and attack again, well, we can see that we got the same value. And the reason for that is that we always exit our game after the first attack was done or the first two attacks, one by the player, one by the monster, were done. Because what Python at the moment does is, it basically scans our code from top to bottom, sees, okay, we have a player variable, we have a monster variable, we print this code right here, then we have an input, and then we have this if statement right here. So if we select one, Python simply sees, okay, we selected one, so I will run this code, I will print monster and player, and then I will stop executing the code, because we are done. There is nothing to tell Python, please repeat the code or anything like that. Now this brings us to the next control structure we need right here. We need a way to tell Python that it shouldn't exit the game after the first attack was done, but it should continue the game until a certain exit condition that we define. An exit condition, if you remember back the slide, would be something like the health of either the monster or the player is equal to or smaller than zero. This is something we'll implement in a few minutes. Let's focus on this logic to stay in the game or to keep executing the code until we tell Python that we are done and that we want to exit the game now. We learned about the if statement already, which allows us to create this structure right here. Another control structure is a so-called while loop. A code running inside of such a while loop is executed as long as a condition that we define is true. Now, this sounds kind of abstract, so let's create this while loop now and then see why this is exactly what we might need right here. For that, we will add the new code up here, because when we initialize our game, this information is important for Python, it has to know the initial values for our variables, but once this initialization was done, we only want to execute code that is running inside of our while loop. As long as this while loop is true, our game is running. If we exit the while loop, well, the game is no longer running. So we create the while loop by simply typing while right here. And now we have to define a condition. And in our case, the condition could actually be something like, well, while our game is running, well, execute that code. As soon as our game is no longer running, well, then don't execute this code again. This means we can actually declare another variable up here before we create the while loop. And this could be something like game running equals, well, true. Now what is true now? True is a so-called Boolean. Booleans can be either true or false. I showed you that in the beginning already. These allow us to easily control while loops, for example. Because if we say that the initial value for game running is true, well, we can simply add this logic right here to say game running equals true. So basically, as long as we don't change the value right here, so it's true here, well, please keep it running. But if we want to exit this loop now, we only have to change game running from true to false. And with that, this condition is no longer met and we exit our while loop immediately. Important though, to be able to tell Python that our code should only be executed inside our while loop or that the code belongs to this while loop basically, we have to indent the code. This means we can select everything right here, so all the code we wrote so far, and now hit tab to basically indent it now. If you now save this, we shouldn't get an error. 
And as you can see, if we now run the code, Python game, attack, attack, we stay inside our loop and important, the health values also decrease. As you can see, the monster has a health of 80 and the player of 76, which makes sense after two rounds because the monster received two attacks, 10 each from the player, and the player received two attacks from the monster with 12 each, so 90, uh, not 90, sorry, 80 versus 76, and if we continue attacking, this decreases more and more. We can also get to health levels below zero, as I said, this is something we'll address soon. The problem is that we don't exit our loop though. Now for that, as I said, we only need to define a case where this true changes to false. For that, we could add another if statement, so after these statements right here, if our player health right here is smaller than or equal to zero, well then we simply say that game running should be set to false, like that. If we now exit our game, we can do this by hitting Ctrl and Z right here, now clear this maybe, and now run the code once again. We can attack, attack again, 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 oops, sorry, invalid input, so again, again, and let's see, yep. Now we can see that we reached a health level of minus eight for our player, and because of that, we exited our game. Why did this happen? Just to repeat that. We said that the game running variable is set to false as soon as our player is dead, basically. This is the sign for our while loop to stop being executed, and with that, we are basically outside of our loop. Well, and with that, we basically are outside of our code, because there is no more code to run at the moment for Python. Now, by the way, we used this double equal sign right here, right, these two. We also used this right here, the smaller than or equal sign. These are so-called comparison operators in Python. Now, we saw two of these already. We also have more. We also have something like smaller than, larger than, larger than or equal to. And we also got this, this one right here, which basically means not equal to. So these are operators we can use to basically check if a specific value is equal to another value. So as you can see right here, these are really helpful. Besides these uh, comparison operators, let me change that back to smaller than and equal to, we also have another really helpful operator type in Python, the so-called logical operators. And these can be helpful right now because at the moment we only check if our player health is smaller than or equal to zero, but actually if our monster is dead, we also want to stop executing our code. And the logical operators are simply and, so this means it would check if the player is dead and if our monster health right here is also smaller than or equal to zero but that's basically not what we want right here because we basically want to exit the game if either of the two is dead and not if both are dead. We could also use not right here, which would simply check if the player health, if the player is dead and if the monster is not dead, so if the monster is still alive, also not what we want right here. And we can also use or another logical operator, which simply says check if either this condition right here, this one, or that condition is true, and if that's the case, please execute the code right here. Now, if we quickly change our player attack right here to a level above the one from the monster, to 13 for example, and run the code once again, you can see that the monster health, the first one right here, is at 87, and so on, like this and like this and like that. And now, as you can see, our monster is dead up here, and we stop our code execution. So the logical operator right here, also pretty helpful if you have situations like that where you want to run a code depending on whether one of multiple conditions is met. However, our current code has a logical issue because we do check if the player or the monster is dead down here, but wouldn't it make more sense to actually check this after each attack? 
Because let's assume that our monster health decreased below zero after the first attack our player made. This can happen right here, right? So it is possible that this code runs, then the monster has a health level below zero. But what will happen then is that the player can still be attacked by the monster. We don't have any logic to check if the monster is able to make his attack because, well, it's only checked after this if condition was run. So after we enter the command, we make our two attacks, one by the player, one by the monster, and then we check if the game can continue running. And this doesn't make a lot of sense, actually. So adding the check actually, well, right here after the monster attack and right there after the player attack is what we should do next. For that, we can use our new knowledge that we gained regarding booleans right here. Because why don't we use something like a player1 boolean and a monster1 boolean? And then we add an if condition right here to check if the monster is still alive. So basically we do something like if monster um, health right here is smaller than or equal to zero. Then we have to do something. We basically have to end the game. We'll implement that code soon. But for a moment, let's simply create this placeholder. And to do this, we can use pass right here. So what pass simply does is it basically shows Python, okay, there is some code required right here at the stage. I did not create that code at the moment. So Python simply sees, okay, we need some code right here, but it doesn't throw an error. It basically understands that we have a, a placeholder right here, you could say, and therefore it keeps executing the following code without an error, because if you would not add this right here, you would get an error. And if that is not true, so if the monster is alive, well, then the monster can attack back. So we can add else right here no elif statement required because we basically need to say only okay the monster is alive so let's attack the player so else we say the player health should decrease and afterwards we of course also have to check if the player health right here is smaller than or equal to zero like that and we can also add pass for the moment because we will add the code in a few seconds these print statements can stay here for the moment. We'll also put them to a different position later. Now, these are the if checks I talked about, but I also mentioned something like player one or monster one. These follow the same logic we have up here for game running. The only difference is, of course, that we will basically declare that variable inside our game because we don't need to add these right here because the information if the player won or not is not required outside our actual game logic right here, but it's part of the actual game. So let's say as long as the game is running, the initial value for player won should be equal to false because when the game starts or as long as the game is running, nobody won. And the same thing is true for our monster1 variable right here. This should also be set to false, like that. Now, with these two variables defined, we can go to our code right here and say that if our monster is dead, well, then player1 right here should be set to true because, well, the monster died, the player1. And the same logic also applies right here if the player is dead. If the player is dead, then our monster1 should be set to true also, right? Because then we can use this logic right here and go down to this if check and basically change this logic to simply player1 equals true or monster1 equals true, right? Like that. Well, then the game ends. So let's see if this works still. Let's run the code. Let's attack. Let's attack. Let's attack. Or attack this and like that. And now if we hit one once again, we can see that the game was exited because our player won the game. As you can see right here, the monster only has a health of minus four. So it's basically dead. So with that, we refactored our code. We now have these checks at the right position. Another thing that I don't like though is that we basically exit the game as soon as the player or the monster won. Basically it's correct, that's what we wanted to implement. So I wanted to kind of escape this while loop right here because we say that the game stops as soon as somebody won. 
But actually, it should not be the entire game that stops after somebody won. It should actually be only the current round that is stopped. Because what we actually need is, we need to make sure that as soon as the player or the monster won, the default values for the health, so 100 for the monster and the player, are set again. And with that we should be able to start the next round immediately and not exiting the entire game and then having to enter Python game PY again to start the game. That's not what we want. But we can implement that easily now with our knowledge that we gained so far. Because why don't we just add a second while loop, which is something like new round. So as long as new round is true, we keep running our current game. As soon as new round is false, so as soon as the monster or the player won, we exit the current round and start a new game. Now, let's have a look at how we could implement that. Because we could say right here, after our first while loop, we add this while loop. So let's say while new round is equal to true, right? This should happen. So let's maybe indent our code right here once again, like that. And we can define the new round right here inside our first while loop. So new round should be equal to true at the beginning. Now with that, we can say that as long as game running is set to true, which we define right here, new round is also set to true. And as long as new round is set to true, this code should be executed. This means if we simply change down here our game running, right, to new round right here, we should be able to exit our round as soon as the monster or the player won. And then we will go back to our game. And this means the logic that we exit the entire game as soon as somebody won should now be fixed. Now let's see if you run Python game and click attack multiple times. Hmm, this is not working. The code keeps getting executed and we don't have any kind of hint that we actually exit this second loop right here. The problem here is this part right here, our variables. Because we never leave this first while loop. We basically set game running to true. Then as long as this is true, we say that new run should be true. Then we say as long as this is the case, please execute this code. Then we set new round to false. And what happens then is we go back to this first while loop. Now, this is nice. But what is missing here is the resetting of the values. So we basically continue using the values, the changed values already. And that's why the health level right here keeps decreasing, as you can see up here. Besides that, we also have the issue that only the monster health keeps decreasing. That's simply due to the fact that we never get to execute this code right here. Because what's basically happening is at the moment that we have the situation that the monster health is smaller than or equal to zero. Well, and this means the code right here is no longer executed. So with each round, we start again our while loop. Then we come right here to if monster health is smaller than or equal to zero. Well, this is the case. Therefore, we go down here to if player one is true or monster one is true. In our case, the player has one, so the new round is false and so on. So we basically skip this second um, else block right here. This will be automatically fixed if we implement the logic correctly now. Now, as I said, the problem is that we don't reset the values and to easily fix that, we can simply take this code right here and put it into our first while loop right here with the correct indentation, of course. With that, we make sure that as soon as we leave our while loop right here, we go back to the game running and initialize our variables with these default values. Now let's see if this works now. If we now run the code, hit attack multiple times to see that the monster should be dead now. Now it is, now let's attack. And as you can see, now the monster is back at 87 after the first round. This means the player made one attack. If I continue doing this, you can see now the monster is dead, minus four, now we have another round and the values are resetted like that. And the monster again has only a health of 87. So with that new structure, we basically control the entire game logic only with these two while loops. So this one right here and this one right there. The only problem we have now is that we are not able to exit the game, but this should be an easy fix now, right? 
because we can simply add a third print statement right here. So print free exit game like that. And now we can simply add another elif statement right here. So elif player um, choice is equal to free. Then we say, oops, not like that. Let's add the quotation mark um, right here. Then we can say that, well, what should happen? Well, game running right here should be set to false. With that, we will also exit this while loop. So let's say game running should be equal to false right here. Now let's check that. Let's leave the game, clear it and run the code. So attack is working. And if I hit free now and exit the game, hmm, this is not working. Do you know why? Well, of course we are setting game running to false, but we are still right here in our new round loop. So we of course also have to change our new round to false. With that, if we run our code once again, oops, not like that, like that. Attack works, exit game works. Now we are out of our game, hit it again, we can start it and exit it. So this is also working fine now. We are making a good progress with the game in general, I would say. I would like to work on two things now though. The first thing is I would like to add another input field because at the moment we have a fixed value for the name key for the player and I think it would be nicer if we can add our name individually right here. We could also change this for the monster but I think the fixed monster name is fine right here. As a second step, I would like to make our game a bit more beautiful. So maybe add some more print statements and yeah, maybe make it better, display the health information more often, things like that. But let's start with that additional input right here. Because when we start the game, I would like to be able to enter the player name. Now, to do that, we can simply um, add another print method right here, print function. And this could be something like enter player name right here. Now with that we print that, but of course we also want to be able to change the player name according to our input. Now for that we need to access the name key once again and change the value. So why don't we just set player name right here equal to, not to what, an input once again, because the player should be able to enter the name on his own right here. With that, if we start our game once again, we can see that we can enter the player name, let's say menu right here, and then the game starts. And as we can see, the rounds continue like that. And as soon as the game ends, yeah, we can enter the player name once again. So this is working fine. I would like to have some more visual improvements now, as I said a few seconds ago. The first thing we could do right here is we could add an additional print statement on top of our enter player name. And this print statement should, should just be some dotted line, you could say, which separates the content a bit, makes it easier to read in the end. For that, we can simply print. And now we enter two quotation marks. And now we simply add three lines like that. So three dashes basically. And now we can use another arithmetic operator right here, this one right here, the star to multiply these by a number of our choice. Let's maybe say seven or something like that. This simply means we want to print 21 of these dashes um, before the enter player name text is printed. So let's have a look at that. If we exit the game like this, you can see this is this nice line right here. And I think this improves the look of our game a bit. We could also add such a, well, separator, you could say, right here before we can select the actual action. This is just some cosmetical improvement, of course, nothing that is really required, but I think it's nice to freshen up the game a bit with these things. Feel free to add this at additional positions. I'm happy with that at the moment. What I'm not happy about is the fact that we don't see the health at the beginning of the game and also at the end of the game, because if I select the action now, you can see that we see the health, right? We see it right here. But we don't have any kind of information regarding, well, the player health is this value and the monster health is that value right here. So let's first add the health information at the beginning of a game and then improve the way the health status is displayed throughout the game. Now at the beginning of the game, 
means that we have to go up here. So once the game is started up, so we can say that after the player entered his name, we want to print right here, our player name right here. And now we want to add the information while well, something like the player, so manual or whatever name we gave him has a 100 health like that. But 100 health should be retrieved from the um, dictionary right here of the player. And 100 health for the monster should be retrieved from this dictionary because we could also change our health to 200 or something like that uh, when the game starts. So I want to make sure that this is displayed at the beginning and that the player has the information about the health amounts at the beginning of the game. For that, we have to combine different types of information right here. The first thing is right here, the value from the dictionary. This will return a string, so this should be fine right here. But if we now add a plus sign like that, we can combine a second information that should be printed right here. Now, as I said, if I want to print the player name has a specific amount of health, then we could add something like has right here. So an ordinary string. We can also add space at the beginning and at the end because this will make sure that the player name and has is not connected directly, but that we have some space in between these two um, values that should be displayed right here. After that, we can add another plus to add our player health, right? We learned how this works. So the player health should be displayed like that. So with that, we can now access the health value or the health key with the corresponding value of 100 right here. The problem though is that if we would execute it like this, we will get an error. Let me show you this. So if I start the game once again, enter the name, then you can see that we get an error that we can only concatenate strings, not integers. The issue is that player name right here in our print statement is a string. It's manual right here, or if we change it, it's the input that the player gave us. So manual in this case has is, an, is a string. We can see it right here. But player health is an integer. And this causes a problem here because, well, as we said, we cannot concatenate strings and integers. There is one easy solution for that issue though. We can simply use the so-called string method in Python to turn our value right here into a string. Now, how does this work? We simply add str in front of the value that should be, well, kind of converted to a string, you could say. Now we open the brackets right here and we are done. Because as you can see right here, now we basically, well, kind of wrapped our player health into this string method. And with that, it should be turned into a string. We'll see in a few seconds if this works. Let's just add one last item right here to our print statement. And this simply is, well, another string with a space at the beginning, health, because like that, health, because I just want to print player name. So whatever name we give the player has 100. So this value, health. Now let's see if this works. Let's save it. And let's run the code once again. Let's enter menu. And as you can see, we print menu has 100 health right here on top. Now this works fine. So let's also do the same thing for our um, monster right here. Here we simply have to change the um, monster name right here like this. And this should be the monster health. Important to keep in mind, player name right here refers to the variable right there because we gave the variable a different information right here. So we said that the player name is equal to our input. The monster name right here is still equal to the value we have for the name key on top right here in our monster variable. With that, if we quickly um, exit our game, run it once again, enter the name, we see that we have menu with 100 health and max with 100 health too. We could also add to make it a bit more readable the print statement right here again, so that we have the separation. So with that, we made the startup a lot more beautiful. Let's now have a look at the content we print throughout the actual round while it's running. Because right here, I see something that I don't like. These two print methods right here. Because our if statement right here should actually just contain the logic to see how much health impact the player attack has. And then to see if the counterparty, so the monster or the player right here is still alive. Of course, we also want to make sure that we kind of show the impact of the monster attack. But these two print methods, no, I don't think this should be placed right here. So let's delete it. And let's now think about a better location for these methods. 
Well, I think a better location would be down here because here we have the actual selections, but after these selections are checked, so after we know which choice the player made, then we can add these statements. And for that, we should refactor this if statement right here too. Because what is actually happening? Well, if player one right here is equal to false, and now we use the and logical operator, and if monster1 right here is also false, so basically this means both the player and the monster are still alive, then please print something like um, player name has player health, the same logic we used above already, left, but what do we have to do right here? We have to put the left into quotation marks and add a space. And we have to combine these different values we want to output with a plus right here and right there. The same thing could be printed for our monster, of course. So we could say the monster right here also has a specific amount of health left. By the way, um, selecting these two items at once simply works by pressing Command D on the Mac right here. Here we have an issue still because I overlooked this has, so we should select both of these and now put it into a single quotation marks and add a space at the beginning and at the end of it. Now this looks better. And we should add the plus right here, of course, like this and like that. Now we don't have an error here anymore, but we should also refactor this code down here now. Because if nobody won, well, then this code will run. But L if, so else if, the player one, by the way, we can also get rid of this true statement right here, because if you just write like player one, then this automatically means that if player one is true. So basically writing this player one equals true is the same thing as writing if player one. So if player one, we could say we also print something like um, player name plus one and of course new round is set to false then that is still correct and another elif right here if the monster one like that new round is also set to false and we should print right here or maybe not refer to the player the monster name we could simply type something like um the monster one like this right here. Now with that we refactored our code a bit. We are now able to print different statements depending on whether the player has one or the monster has one. And we also print the current health status if nobody won. So if the round basically continues. One thing we have to change here though is we have to turn our health right here into a string again. That's also the same issue we had above where we also added the print statement. So let's add the string method right here and um, right there like this. So if we now restart the game right here, enter the name, attack, we can see, maybe let's cre decrease it a bit. We can see menu has 88 left, so it decreases, it keeps decreasing. And now we see that menu won because the game was over. As we can see, the monster, so Max only had nine left. And we see that I won the game in this case. So this is working fine also and with that we improved the structure of our game a lot as I would say. A good next step now would be to also work on the other if statements. Specifically I would like to work on the heal option right here because at the moment we can basically just attack or exit the game. But heal player still is simply well just a print statement. So let's work on that now. If our player says that he just wants to heal himself and not attack the monster, then the logic is a bit different. Because what will happen then? Well, we can simply say that if the player wants to heal himself, then player health, right here, so we again access the health key of our player, is equal to, well, the player health that he currently has, but now not minus something because we don't want to subtract something, we want to add right here the heal amount we defined for our player. 
just to bring that back to your mind, the heal amount is this key right here. So we have a heal key with a value of 16. So let's add this now. So we can say that player health is equal to the current player health plus the player heal that we have right here. What we don't need here is now, we don't need to check whether our player is still alive because, well, if he survived the previous round, then he will be able to heal himself. Because of that, the health will increase. But after the player healed himself, well, the monster will still be able to attack the player. So we have to add this monster attack now. To do that, we can simply say that player health now, but this is now the updated player health, so this one right here. So player health is equal to, well, the player health again, so the current value for the player health, minus the monster attack that we have. So basically, it's the same logic that we had right here. However, after this attack, we have to check whether our player is still alive. So we can again copy that code right here. So if the player health is below zero or equal to zero, then, well, unfortunately, our player has lost the game and the monster has won. So this would be the logic for our second choice right here, for our second option. Let's quickly check if this works. Let me enter name and exit the game. So let's now restart the game. And let's enter the name once again. And let's attack. Yeah, we have 88 life left. So let's see if we heal ourselves. We got 92 left, which basically makes sense because we got an attack from the monster of 12, but we had a heal level of 16. So we increased our health by four. So this is also working fine now. With that code added, I think it's time to think about the core game logic once again. Because at the moment we have a pretty, well, let's say, easy to predict game result. Because we only have two attack options for the player and the monster. So it's 13 for the player and 12 for the monster. So basically if the player always attacks, well, he will win the game. That's pretty boring, so I think we should make this a bit more dynamic. And I actually don't want to change the player values right here. I think these are okay. But I'm not happy with the monster right here. Because wouldn't it be great if we could make this a bit more dynamic if we define a minimum value for the monster attack and a maximum value and then kind of create something which allows us to dynamically select a value in between this minimum and maximum. With that we have a random element in our game and this would make it a lot more exciting. Now how can we achieve that? Well the first thing is we should get rid of that single key right here and add two keys instead of this one. One could be attack min right here for the minimum attack value, which could be equal to let's say 12. And then we add another value or another key and value, which could be attack max right here, which could have a value of, well, let's say 20 maybe even. This can make it a little bit more exciting. Let's maybe decrease this a bit to 10, let's say. Something like that. With that, we now have these two options. The problem is that we now need a way to, well, kind of choose a value in between 10 and 20 randomly for each round. For that purpose, we need to import a so-called module to Python. Now, what is a module? Generally, we could write everything from scratch right here in Python. This is generally possible, but it's not really convenient. And it would mean that we have to write a lot of code and a lot of logic just for things like, well, creating such a random number in the end. Because of that, Python comes with a lot of different modules which can be imported to your project and which come with these features implemented by default. But the important thing is that you can use different features of this module in a very, very convenient way. Now, let's see how this works now because I think then it will become a lot clearer. You basically import a module to Python by simply going to the top of your code right here and then import the module of your choice. In our case, we need to import from the so-called random module. More about modules can be found in the link in the video description, by the way. And from this random module, we want to import a specific feature, you could say. In our case, we want to import the rand int feature, this one right here. The rand int feature simply allows us to return a random integer between a bottom and a top 
corridor, you could say. So in our case, between the minimum attack and the maximum attack. And the cool thing about this module now is that we can simply use this feature without writing any additional code. We only have to use a specific method. As I said, methods and functions are something we'll cover in a few seconds. And then we will get back a random number. Now, a lot of talking, how does this work now? Well, basically, we want to have our monster attack down here. So this basically, this monster attack is now no longer a fixed value, but this should be a random value. For that, we can simply define a variable, let's say monster attack, really important. This now is a variable. You can see this with the underscore right here. And I don't refer to the monster attack key right here, right? That's important. So I'm not referring to any kind of attack key, which by the way, is also not existing any longer. And I want to store an information, a specific information in that variable. And this information now is something that is only available because we imported this random module. I will now use a so-called function or a method. Um, we will dive deeper into functions in a few minutes. So just to give you a big picture, a function is simply some code that can be executed whenever we call this function. So whenever we tell Python to, well, refer to that function, you could say, then this code will be executed. And the rand int is a function which is available due to the random module we imported. So we don't see the actual code inside that function right here. But we have this function or method available now as we use this random module. A function is called by typing the function name and adding the parenthesis right here. So adding the parenthesis simply means that you call the function. We have two types of functions though. Also something we'll have a look at later by the way. We have functions with empty parentheses. This would be something like this. Or in the case of the rand in function, we have a function which requires so-called parameters or arguments. If a function requires such arguments, this simply means that we have to pass some additional information from outside to this function to make sure the code inside the functions can be executed correctly. And the information we pass to this function are so-called arguments. We will have a look at parameters and arguments also later in more detail. So the important thing right here is we have this rand in function. So this predefined code we can execute whenever we need it. And we have to add additional information to this function to make sure the code can be executed correctly. Now, as we want to calculate a random integer, we need to add two arguments here. The first one is the minimum value for our attack. So we need monster attack min right here. And the second argument is the monster attack max. That's the second argument. And with that, we are now able to call this function inside our variable. And with that, to retrieve the calculated random number for the monster attack. With these two arguments added, we now made sure that if we refer to the monster attack variable, this function is called and executed. And therefore, we only have to change our monster attack right here with the monster underscore attack variable, because if we now subtract this monster attack variable, we will subtract the result of the rand int function. And this will be this random attack value calculated due to our random module. So this was a lot of talking. Let's now see if this works. So let's exit the game and start it once again. Enter a player name and let's attack the monster. So we see menu has 83 left now. So we kind of deducted 17. Let's try it another time. Now we have 65 left. So 83 minus 18, 18 is 65. So another random number. Now we have 50 left, so 15. So basically this seems to work. Now with this random module right here, we are able to create this random integer. Now we simply have to also copy that code from here to down there to our second choice if we decide to heal ourselves. And let's make sure the indentation is correct right here. Like this and like that. So this is now working fine, but we just saw something that you should avoid no matter if you're writing Python code or any other code. We just copy and pasted, well, basically the same code, right? That's not always a totally bad thing, but especially if we have things like this monster attack right here. So this line right here and right there. This is not really a good, well, code structure, I would say. 
because what is actually happening right here is we only need this code to get this random integer. Now, wouldn't it be better to kind of outsource this code and to kind of to be able to refer to the result of this calculation right here in monster attack? At the moment, this is not possible because we first have to define or declare the variable to get back this value. Situations like that are the perfect area or application area for so-called functions. Now, what are functions? Functions basically allow us to run a specific predefined code whenever we call such a function. Calling a function simply means that we tell the function that it should be executed now. Now, how do we write such functions? Let's go down to the code and create such a function. A function in Python is created by simply typing the dev keyword right here. Now we have to give the function a name and the name should basically describe what is well basically done inside the function. So in our case, what are we calculating? And this could be something like um, monster attack maybe like this. The problem is that we have monster attack already right here for our variable. And this is something you should avoid. You should not name variables and functions equal. That's something you should not do. Therefore, we will just change the name here to monster attack, or maybe let's call it calculate um, monster attack like that. With that, we have a different naming right here. Then we add parentheses right there, and then we add a colon. And here we now have a function which doesn't require any arguments. You remember when we used the rand int function before, we had to add the attack min and attack maximum as arguments, otherwise the function wouldn't work correctly. In this case, we don't need that arguments because the function doesn't require any additional information from outside. And with that, we're basically back to our already known Python programming syntax because now we hit enter and now the indented code right here will only be executed if we call, so if we basically execute the function right here. Now, what we want to do is if we refer to this function, we just want to have this random integer. So we can just refer to this code right here, copy it and paste it right there into our function. So let's now see what happens if we save that right here. We can see it. We get no errors, so this seems to work okay. So let's exit the game and let's now start the game once again. Enter name, attack. Well, this works fine, of course, but the problem is that we basically don't use the function right now because as I said before, we have to call a function to really execute the code that we saved right here. What does this mean for us? Well, we basically should get rid right here in our first if statement of the monster attack variable. We don't need this variable anymore because the only purpose of this variable was to basically calculate this random number. This is now done by our function. And we can instead of that now say that we just refer to the calculate monster attack function and important to call a function in Python, we have to add the parenthesis right here. Let's now save this and let's now see what is happening. So if we now exit the game, enter name menu, oops, like that, say attack, then we get an error. It says that the calculate monster attack right here, this name is not defined. But that's strange, right? Because actually we defined it down there but somehow Python doesn't know that this function exists and therefore has no idea what it should do right there. Now, this is also really important to understand. The code right here in Python and generally in programming actually is always read or parsed from top to bottom. This means if we think about what is Python doing right here, it starts reading the code up there, scans the code, scans the code, scans the code, and then it sees, okay, we want to execute or call a function right here. But the problem is that Python has no idea that this function is defined down there because as I said, the code is parsed from top to bottom. Therefore, how should it know that? Therefore, we will take this function now, scroll to the top of our code and add it right here ahead of our first while loop. With that, Python now understands that we have a function named calculate monster attack and that this function will be called right here. Now let's see what happens now if you run the game once again, enter the player name menu right here and attack. 
Now we have another problem. Python is aware of our function, but we basically have something like an unsupported operand type. The core thing right here is this non-type because our function is not returning anything at the moment. Because we basically told our function up here that it should calculate the random integer. But the problem is we didn't tell the function what it should do then. So it calculates that integer, but well, then that's it. Therefore, we have to add another important statement to this function right here. The so-called return statement, like this. Return simply tells Python that it should, well, return the result of this operation. And the result of this operation is the calculated value for our attack. So if we save that now and run the code once again, enter the player name and attack, then you can see that this is working now. Because now basically what happens is we say that we call the function right here, we calculate the value for our monster attack and we return that value. And with that, we insert the value right here in our function and therefore the player health is recalculated. What we can do now, of course, is we can also take that code, so this player health we just created, and also replace it for our second if case right here. Important, make sure to do the indentation correctly too. So besides the fact that we now refactored our code again, made it a bit leaner, which is always good. We also had a first look at functions. And to be more precise, we actually saw two types of functions already. Let's scroll up a bit to the functions we use. Because we have our calculate monster attack function and we have our rand int right here. So the function we use from our random module that we imported. And if you look at the parentheses at the end of these two functions, we see a big difference. The first function right here has empty parentheses. This means this function doesn't require any arguments or parameters. The rand in function on the other hand requires two arguments. In our case monster attack min and monster attack max. What's the difference here? Well the calculate monster attack function doesn't need any kind of external information to run correctly. Because if we call that function we simply execute this code right here. And this code comes with all the information needed, well, to run the function. This means we don't need any parameters right here. We don't have to pass any arguments to that function. So any external information you could say. This is different for our random integer function right here. We need to calculate a random integer between a minimum and a maximum value. And this minimum and maximum value in our case is some external information. And to pass this external information into our function, we use a so-called argument. In our case, we have two arguments. We have the minimum attack and the maximum attack. We don't have to use these external um, information as arguments here, by the way. We could also use fixed values, for example, 10 as the first argument. And for the max value as the second argument, we could use 20. That would also be possible. 20, like that. This would also be possible. But this would make our well, code a lot less dynamic because actually the monster variable right here and the corresponding dictionary contains the information about the minimum and maximum attack. So instead of using fixed values as arguments right here, we can simply pass attack min and attack max as arguments for the first parameter. So this is monster attack min and the second parameter receives the monster attack max as an argument. So that's the core idea behind um, functions, parameters and arguments. Parameters simply allow us to add additional information to functions to make sure the code inside the function works correctly. And the information we pass to these parameters are our so-called arguments. So attack min and attack max in our case. However, Using the function like this is working fine in this case, but this is not a perfect solution to be honest. Because at the moment we declare our variable, so monster right here, and we refer to this variable inside our function. And after we declared the variable, we call the function down here, calculate monster attack. But there can be situations where this can cause problems. Because what if we want to call our function before we declare the actual variable? For example, we could print our calculate monster attack function right here. 
if we run our code now, we get an error because the name monster is not defined. Because what's happening is that, well, Python parses the code, it reads the code and finds the function, then goes into our while loop, and then we want to print the function. And then we have a problem because Python has no idea that this monster variable exists because we use it in the function, but we declare it after we call the function. Therefore, this approach is not perfect here. We can stick to it for the moment though, but actually we should improve that code to make sure we avoid errors like that. However, we will work on that as soon as we are diving deeper into parameters and arguments because an argument might be helpful here. Nevertheless, if we delete it right here and run the code again, we can see this still works fine, so we'll stick to that solution for the moment. Now, why don't we practice that a bit and create another function which also requires an argument? Well, for that we can scroll down and here, in our game ending or round ending situations where either the player won or the monster won, I think it would be a nice place to add such a function. Because we could actually create a function that might be called something like um, game ends, something like this which gets called if the player or the monster won. So we can actually delete this print statement right here and also right there and add game ends right here. Like this, as you can see, I added the parenthesis. So like this, we call this function and we don't pass any argument. We of course also have to define the function, or create the function. So let's go up here again. Now to create the game and function without any arguments and say that this should print something like maybe um, the player one like this. If we do that and run the code, let's enter player name, attack, 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 attack. Uh, it seems that we might lose, let's see. Ah, we made it though, we actually won the game, but the problem still is that even if the monster would have won the game, we would always print the player one because we always call this game ends function and this game ends function, well, simply prints the player one. So wouldn't it be better if we would be able to pass an argument to this function, which basically simply is the player name in case the player one right here, or something like the monster in case the monster won. For that, we need to add a parameter to our function. This can be done up here in the parentheses. And now we can specify a name for this parameter. In our case, this could be like the winner name, for example, like this. So we now have this function with this parameter. And now we need an argument that gets passed to that function to be able to use it inside our function. At the moment, we don't use it, but we will add that in a few seconds. For that, we can go back right here and now simply add the argument, so the argument that gets passed to this parameter inside the parenthesis right here. Now what is the argument we need in case the player won? Well, it's of course the player name right here, like that. And for the monster, well, I think that's quite obvious, it's the monster name of course, like this and like that. So in case the player wins the game, we call the game ends function and we pass the player name as an argument. This argument now gets passed to this function right here as this winner name parameter. Important, as you can see, the naming of the um, argument right here and the parameter right there doesn't have to be equal. It can be, but it doesn't have to. But important, if you want to use the argument then inside your function, then you have to name it identically. For example, if we want to print the winner name, we have to add winner name right here, like this. With that, if we exit our game, clear it and run it once again, enter the name menu, and attack, 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 we can see max right here. So this means the monster, because this is the name of the monster, won the game. So this is working, we now pass the argument to our function and can dynamically output the winner name. The problem is that I might also want to have something like a little bit of a sentence right here because just printing the name like this is not really nice as I would say. For that, something like using a string as we had it before, for example, um, player won the game 
like that would be good. But player should actually not be the player. It should be either the player name or if the player won or the monster name if the monster won. And we have to use it dynamically, well, based on the argument we have right here. To do this, we have a really nice feature in Python also. It's called formatted string literals or F strings. And these allow us to dynamically inject content into strings. So exactly what we want to achieve right here. To create such an F string, you simply add, well, an F in front of your string. So this is the string that we are um, using right here. And you simply wrap the content that you want to dynamically inject into your string with curly braces. So like this and like that, this would be the player then being injected dynamically. But as I said, this is not working at the moment because the name of the argument right here and right there inside our function, so where we want to use that argument has to be equal. So with that, we can simply add winner name right here. So what is happening now is that if the player, for example, wins the game, we pass the player name to our function and then we use this argument right here inside our F string. If the monster wins, the same thing happens, but the winner name will be the monster name and not the player name. Now let's see if this works. So let's escape our game, clear it, run it once again, enter name, attack, 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 and attack. Max won the game, so this is working fine. Let's now also see if we can win the game. Like this, so let's maybe start with healing ourselves, healing again, attacking the monster, healing ourselves. Oh, this doesn't work good, healing. Can we win the game? We might have to readjust the, the gaming logic a little bit. Uh, I think we will lose again. Yeah, now we won the game, we did it. So as you can see, now we won the game and this is also printed now dynamically because now menu, so the player name is used in our function. Let's move away from functions now and let's work again on the user experience. Because we have this output right here, so monster or player won the game. This is nice, but actually I would like to add some more information on the player after a round or a game ended because Let's say that the monster won, then we would have Max won the game right here. But then I would also like to print the player info, like the player name, the player health he had, and also maybe something like how many rounds it took a single game to end. So to either make sure the player won or the monster won. So for that, we need to print this information and we need to add a counter. Let's work on it step by step and let's print the information first. For that, I will go down right here to our game ending conditions. So either the player or the monster one. We have our game ends function. And after that, I would like to create a new variable. This variable could be something like round result right here. And the round result should contain the following information. It should contain the name, right? So the name of our player. And because of that, we have to refer to our um, player name right here. And it should contain the health level of our player as soon as the round ended. And the health level is of course our player health right here. Now we add a print statement right here to print our round result. And then we copy this information down here to our monster like that. If you remember back, I said that copying and pasting code is not always a best practice. For this purpose here, I will copy paste the code though, because in a few minutes we will basically save our results. And for that, I prefer this approach. I'll come back to that in a few minutes though. So let's keep it this way for the moment. If we now restart our game, enter the name and attack, 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 attack. You can see that menu won the game, so basically the player won the game, and then we save the player stats, so the name and the health. This can be helpful in case we have different players, then each player can see uh, his name and the health level he had. Now besides that, I also wanted to add a counter so that we can see how many rounds it took until the game ended. For that, we simply have to define such a counter first. And where should we do that? Well, right here in our first while loop in our game running while loop. Because as soon as we start a new game, not a new round, a new game, the counter has to be reset. 
Well, and what should be the value for a counter initially? Initially, well, it should be zero. So we can say the counter is zero right here at the start of the game. Now, whenever we start a new round, the counter should increase by one because we start a new round, the counter goes up, the round ended, the next round starts and the counter increases. Because of that, we can simply add the counter right here in our second while loop, so the new round while loop, and we can again refer to our counter variable and say that the counter should be the initial value of the counter, this one, plus one, because we increase the counter by one. And as long as we stay inside our round, the counter will be one when we start the round, then we go through our while loop, we stay in the round, the second round starts, so the counter increases to two. If the round ends, we go back to our first while loop right here and set the counter back to zero. So that should be the logic. Let's now also print this counter right here in our round result. And for that, we can simply add it as another key right here. So this could be the rounds key right here. And well, the value for rounds is simply our counter variable. Let's also add this down here. Um, for our monster one case. Now let's see if this works. Let's end the game and restart it. Enter name, attack, 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 attack. And yeah, as we can see, Max won the game, so the monster won the game. The player was Manu, the health level was minus seven, so we were beaten. And it took the monster seven rounds to win against us. So with that, we also implemented such a counter functionality to our game right here. Let's now also try another player name. So let's say the other player is Tony, so another player. Um, Tony attacks, 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 attacks. And again, Max won the game, but the problem is that now Tony is only displayed right here. But actually in the previous round, I was playing against the monster, but my stats were not safe now. Keep in mind that we didn't exit the game, so we actually stayed inside our game, but somehow our results were not saved. This could be the next thing we work on. How can we save the data of a single round right here in our code to make sure we get kind of a, well, results list in the end to see how different players performed against the monster. We actually learned almost everything we need for that already in this video. Because if you remember back the beginning of this video, we talked about lists. And lists allowed us to store, well, different items. And actually, this right here, so this dictionary, is a single item. In the next round, if another player plays against the monster, the result would also be a dictionary, which could be the next list item, and so on. So what we actually only need is an empty list at the beginning of the game, and to this empty list, we then simply add the dictionary, so this one right here, every time a game was finished. So every time either the monster or the player won. For that, we will first create this empty list. And let's create that list up here um, outside of our while loop because basically that's the initial thing that should be created as soon as we run our Python file right here. So let's maybe call this um, game results. And this should be simply an empty list. So with these square brackets right here. And well, this empty list won't help us a lot, but if you now scroll down again right here to our, well, game ending condition as I was referring to, then actually this round result variable is everything we need right here. We have this round result variable which contains the dictionary I was referring to. So if we could just add this dictionary to our list, we are done already. And this can be done with a default method available for lists. So let's get rid of our print statement right here. And let's now refer to our list, so we call it game results. And now we use a special method by adding a dot. This shows us all the methods or functions available for lists. And the method I'm referring to right here is the one on top. It is append. Because it simply allows us to append an item to an existing list. And what do we want to append right here? Well, we want to append our round results, of course, like that. Uh, not the round results, the round result, sorry for that, like this. And we can, of course, also use this right here for our monster one case, like that. So with that, we should be able to store the result of a round in our list. 
Then to start a new round with a different player name for example. And as soon as this round ends, we should also be able to add this result now, so this new dictionary as the next list item to our list. Just to be sure we understand the code, so let's have a look. We start with this empty list right here as soon as we run our Python file. Then we start our game with our while loop right here. And then we start our round. We go through all our rounds. So just as we did it before, we know the code. And as soon as either the player or the monster win the game, we append the dictionary with the player results. So in this case, this dictionary or the dictionary down here to this existing empty list. If this round was ended, then we go back to our game while loop. So this one right here, but we don't declare this variable once again, because we declared the game results right here outside of our while loops. This means we use our current list, so the game results list containing one item for the next round. Then the code starts again. As soon as the round ends, we add the new result to this list and so on. What will not work here is if we really end the game, so if we use our exit game option right here, then our list will not be stored. So if you run the game once again, then the result will be gone. We could also change that by saving the result to a file, but this is something we won't have a look at in this tutorial. So let's see if this logic I was referring to is working now. Before we do that though, we have to make sure we um, print our result also. So let's print our game um, results right here and right there. Otherwise, well, we can't see a lot like this and like that. So let's now run the game. Let's enter a name for the player. Let's attack, heal, heal, attack, attack, heal. So I'll play around a bit. That well, looks good. Maybe we win this time. Yeah, we can see that menu won the game. We can see the health and the rounds. Let's now add another player, maybe Tony. And let's attack, 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 attack. Yeah, and now we can see that we added the second dictionary also to our list. So this is the second stat and we can also do this um, with another player, let's say Sam, quickly play the game. And we can see Sam is also added right here to our list. As you can see, we have three list items and each list item right here is a dictionary. So dictionary one or item one with the first dictionary, item two with the second one and item three with the third dictionary. And this is working nice, but I'm not happy with two things now. The first thing is that the result is printed automatically right here. I think it would be better if the results, so the printing of the results, would be a, another option. So another player choice, so we could have a fourth player choice, something like right here, print four, um, show results, something like that. And in addition to that, I don't want to show the results like this, so inside this list and also one after another. I would like to have them below each other. So we have the first dictionary right here, then in the second line we have the second dictionary and so on. So let's first implement this fourth choice now and let's then work on the way the information is displayed. Now, as we know the logic already, we know what we have to do right here. We have to create another elif statement right here, there. The player choice is four. Well, what should happen then? Well, basically we only want to print our game results. So we can delete this print statement right here from our player one and maybe cut this one from our monster. And now simply add this right here as the fourth choice, like that. That's it already. So let's exit the game. Let's start it. Let's enter the player name. If we now hit four, we should see nothing. Let's scroll up a bit. Yeah, here is our empty list. So this is working fine. Let's now attack and see what is happening then. Yeah, now we see Max won the game. Now we have to enter the player name for the next round. So let's say Tony wants to start and Tony wants to see what the results from the previous players were. So we can hit four now to show the results. And if we scroll up, yeah, we can see that the result of the last round is printed right here. So this is working fine. This was the first step. The second step now is to, well, change the way the results are shown. As I said, I would like to show the results not inside the list, but dictionary by dictionary, line by line. For that, we need to have a look at the third control structure that is really important in Python. We had a look at the if statements already. 
we had a look at while loops, which basically, basically control our entire application. And now we have a look at for loops. A for loop basically allows us to iterate well over a sequence. A, a sequence is something like, well, a list or a dictionary in our case and to give back a result for each of these iterations. Now, this sounds totally abstract, of course. Therefore, I would like to implement the for loop now, step by step, then see how it works, and then also compare it to the while loop we created so far. Now, where do we create such a for loop? Well, right here in our fourth choice. Because what do I want to achieve right here? As I said, I would like to have a look at the content of our list, so of our game results list right here. And then I would like to basically print or display each single item of this list separately. So if we have three items inside our list, I don't want to print the entire list. I would like to go through the first item, print that. I would like to go to the second item, print it. And then I would like to go to the third item, print it, and so on. This is what I meant with iterating over a sequence, over a list in that case. So basically what I want to tell Python is, have a look at this list iterate for each item this list contains and print it separately. That's what I would like to achieve right here. And for that, we can use the for loop I was referring to. The for loop is written like this. We add for, and now you can add a name of your choice because what you're now saying Python is basically for each item inside a list, do something. And for each item, you can specify a name of your choice. So for example, you could say for item in game results, like that. So you say, for each item you find in the game results list, please do something. At the moment, we will just delete that and say, we don't do anything, we just um, pass right here. Important, item doesn't have to be named item right here. You could also name this for um, score in game results, for um, player stat, in-game results, whatever. This is simply what you name each single list item in your list. So you can name this as you prefer. The important thing here is that you say that for each item in, this is also important, you have to put this right here, in the list in our case, so in this game results variable, please do something. What you could do now is for example, you can simply say that for each item you find inside our list, please print, and now important, this item. Here the naming is important. You have to name this right here equal to the name you gave to each item inside your list. So just to repeat that, what we're not doing right here is we say, please go through the list. So the list saved in our game results variable right here. And for each item, which we named player stat right here in this for loop, please print me the corresponding item. Now let's see if this works now. So we can clear this now. We can run the code once again. Add a name menu, attack, 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 as always. Then we add Tony as the second player. We also attack all the time, maybe heal it once or twice, like that. And now we enter a third player, maybe Sam once again. And now we show the results. If we scroll up a bit, you can see that now we have two changes compared to the previous print statement we had without the for loop. The first thing is that the items are no longer stored in a list. Before we had these square brackets around the dictionaries because, well, the dictionaries were just single list items. Additionally, we also print the items line by line now because these are now single dictionaries because we simply accessed the dictionaries inside our lists, well, basically took them out of the list right here and printed them line by line. So player stat right here, so for player stat is simply this dictionary right here, and that dictionary right there. So that's the for loop. And what's the difference now to the while loop that we previously made? Well, here we iterate over the items inside our list. As soon as the list is over, well, the for loop ends. Our while loop simply keeps running as long as a certain condition is true. So if we never change the new round to false, the new round will continue infinitely. So we will never finish or exit this while loop. This continues forever basically until the condition you defined right here ends. For the for loop, this is different because the for loop will simply end as soon as the iteration over the list items in our case ends. So as soon as the for loop looped through all the items, well, the for loop automatically ends in our case. 
So that's basically the difference. If you want to iterate through items, use a for loop. If you want to keep executing a code until a certain condition is no longer true, then use a while loop. So with that, we are actually done with our game right here, but now is the time to have a look at our code once again and see if we have some issues or if we can improve some things here. Specifically, I want to work on one little problem you could say that we have right here. I showed you that earlier in the video when I called the calculate monster attack function right here before we actually declare the monster variable. If you remember back what we learned about parameters and arguments, then this is exactly what can be helpful here. Now what do I mean by that? Why don't we just say that we add two parameters right here to our calculate monster attack function. For example, attack min as the first parameter and attack max as the second parameter. Now we can copy them and paste them right here to our randin function to be able to use them. And now we only have to go down to our calculate monster attack function, so these two functions right here, and we can see the error already. We didn't add any arguments to the function. We can change that quickly because the first argument should be the monster attack min, right? So referring to our monster uh, variable. And the second one would be monster attack max, like that. Let's quickly copy these down here to the second monster attack. So this is working now, so we shouldn't have an issue. But now, if I again want to print our function before we declare the monster variable, so calculate monster attack, right here, then we can add monster attack min and monster attack max once again. So if we save that, we get an error now right here because as you can see, we are using our variable monster before we are actually assigning it. This means if I cut the print statement now and put it below our variable, we can see this error is gone and with that we improved our code a lot because now we can immediately see that if we want to call the function too early, well, that we get this error and that we first have to declare the variable. So with that, this approach right here is the one to prefer because it makes sure that our code runs correctly and it helps us avoiding errors like that. Let's delete the print statement though and let's also get rid of that empty line. And let's now finally see if it's still working. So we run the game, enter a name, attack, heal. Let's maybe increase it a bit right here. Attack, yeah, this is working. Let's say Tony wants to play. So we again play. Yeah, this works also. Let's now say Sam wants to see the um, results. Yeah, this works fine. And now we want to exit the game. So with that, we refactored our app and also finished our app for this video. I hope you got a good understanding now of the core basics of Python and especially how you can apply them in practice. Because learning to code in theory is nice, but I think applying the knowledge and learning it by really practicing it in a practical project like this is a lot more helpful, at least in my opinion. So with that, I wish you all the best for your Python projects, Dive deeper into Python, it's an awesome language, it's a lot of fun to work with and also make sure to have a look at academind.com, there you can also find more Python content and also a lot more content mainly related to programming and web development. And with that, well, thanks a lot for watching and bye.